I started at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia in 1976 and graduated in 1980. My goal was to learn how to paint realistically, and the Academy was the perfect place for that. But it wasn't just the school itself. The Academy's museum became a major resource for me and my classmates. In 1981, Frank Goodyear, the Academy's dynamic young curator, attempted to bring together all the strands of what was being called the New Realism in his exhibition, Contemporary American Realism, since 1960. Frank Goodyear is now 79 and lives in Wyoming and Arizona. I am honored to have been able to talk to him about an exhibition that has had such a lasting influence on my generation of Academy students. Frank, can you set the stage for how that 1981 show came to be? I came to the Pennsylvania Academy in 1972 one of the first things we did was to close the building. And during the next two years, we were involved in a major renovation of its historic Frank Furness building. The building reopened in 1976 as part of the celebration of America's Bicentennial. And the Academy became again the jewel in the crown of Philadelphia. Prior to this time, the Academy's commitment to contemporary art had been considerable. This commitment was expressed in its annuals for whatever reason, those annuals were discontinued in the 1960s. It seemed to me as a young curator at PAFA that it ought to recommit itself to contemporary art in order to serve its students and the local arts community and to recognize its traditions and continue them. I remember thinking to myself, what better area to explore than a growing resurgence of contemporary American realist art the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts was the perfect place to do this with its classical curriculum based on drawing, the study of the human figure, and with its historical association with America's greatest realist painter, Thomas Aikens, and the Ashcan School. John Sloan, Robert Henry, William Glackens, Everett Chin, all students of the Academy at the turn of the century. So in 1977, I set out to organize an exhibition entitled A Contemporary American Realist. Neil Welliver, Philip Prolstein, Dwayne Hansen, Alfred Leslie, Sidney Goodman, a local Philadelphia artist, Joseph Raphael, Janet Fish, and Stephen Posen. And I chose these eight artists because each one of them represented a very different approach to painting and sculpture, but each one also embraced the basic tenets of realism. Some I might say more than others. Two years later, I organized seven on the figure and it included the great abstract expressionist painter Willem de Kooning, Stephen de Sabler, a sculptor from California, John de Andrea,
Bill Beckman. Joan Brown, also from California. Ben Kamahira. And Jack Beal. This show was not just about realist painters and sculptors, although it included some. It seemed to me back then, reading catalogs, seeing shows, that there was a great deal of confusion about what constituted contemporary American realism. Its descriptive language had become just ridiculously confusing. It was referred to as new realism, hard edge realism, photo realism, new photo realism, super realism, radical realism, unconventional realism, painterly realism, gestural realism, formalist realism, and the list went on and on. I took a six month sabbatical from my curatorial job at PAFA, traveled around America looking at realist work, and organized the show that opened in Philadelphia in 1981. The reason for the show, Contemporary American Realism Since 1960, was to rein in some of this confusion and to give some definition to a huge and diverse body of work. One of the key words in the title of your show is American. Why was that so important to you? The American identity in American art has fascinated scholars and curators since the inception of American art history. The contemporary American realism show was all American. The paintings were big and aggressive. The show itself was big and kind of brassy and it was full of noise and it was bombastic. It looked like America, its cities, its landscapes, its woods, and its farms. its cars and its trucks and its motorcycles. The people in the paintings and sculpture looked and felt like Americans. After the show closed in California, it traveled under the auspices of the United States Information Agency to three European cities, Madrid, Lisbon, and Dusseldorf. And Betsy and I saw the show only in Madrid at the Salon de Bes Artes. The opening was a huge turnout, especially of young Spanish artists. And we were thrilled at the time to meet Andres Segovia, who was there that night. Many of us went out for dinner with a group of young artists. I'll never forget the evening in a densely smoked filled room, people having a great time, drinking wine, talking about the show, talking about America. 
I'll also never forget in walking around Madrid, seeing posters of a near Welliver landscape installed in many of the parks and main boulevards. There was clearly a fascination in Europe with contemporary America, and this show seemed to spark a huge response. Curiously, when the show was over and I was talking with the folks at the United States Information Agency, they were thrilled with the Europeans' response to the show. They felt that it had been a great ambassador for America. And they asked me whether it might be possible for the show to travel in other parts of the world. I think they had in mind Asia. And I said to them, sadly, that the show had been dissembled and that was not going to be possible. But I think the Contemporary American Realism show was a great ambassador for America and for American art. And I remember it proudly and vividly to this day. The Academy Archives has some great photos of the opening. What do you recall about that night? I remember feeling incredibly gratified that so many of the artists in the exhibition came to the opening in Philadelphia. From all over the country, there were over a hundred artists and easily half of them showed up. I think they recognized that something important was happening and they wanted to be part of it. I also think that many of the artists were genuinely grateful that a museum was willing to look at this perhaps underappreciated group of artists and give their work some light in a major exhibition. For me, to get to know the artists and the work was just phenomenal. And it remains one of the highlights of my professional career. You had mentioned studio visits. What was the value of that? And can you tell us a few stories about them? It was always a thrill to visit these artists in the places where they lived and worked. It was a great way to learn about their work. Neil Welliver on his farm in Lincolnville, Maine. Each morning after breakfast, we'd go off hiking, usually for a couple of hours. Neil knew the woods, he knew the bogs, he knew the ponds, he knew the streams on the farm, and he knew them intimately. And I thought to myself as a 19th century American historian, Neil's very much like his predecessors, the Hudson River School painters. He made small nature studies, and many of them became bigger paintings later. Even though Neil studied with Joseph Albers at Yale and often said that his goal was to make a landscape painting as fluid as a de Kooning, on these hikes and with these nature studies, he was acting out, whether he knew it or not, the traditional realist impulse of collecting data on which to base his eventual work. Tell us the Alice Neal story. That's a good one. Uh, very memorable visit to Alice Neal's apartment studio in New York City. I took my wife Betsy and daughter Grace, who was then, I think, about seven years old, with me to see Alice. She didn't know they were coming, and she was delighted that I had brought them along. What a sweet woman she was. Like any grandmother would, when she saw Grace, she got out a small barnyard set of animals for Grace to play with on the floor while Nancy, her daughter-in-law, brought out picture after picture from the back room. To hear her talk about her work was really revelatory. It, it helped me understand a lot about Alice. The part that still makes me chuckle, toward the end of our time, Alice asked me if she could paint my portrait. I was really surprised, flattered, I guess, and Betsy en encouraged me, oh, go ahead and do it until both of us heard that she wanted to do my portrait in the nude. I had this vision of a nude portrait of me hanging on the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts walls. And um, I declined, and I guess I look back on that, and yeah, I probably should have done that. The visit with Philip Perlstein in his home studio on the Upper West Side in New York City when we entered into Philip's studio, I was surprised how small it was 
and that the space he worked in was so very shallow. When he painted his large nude figure paintings, the models were right next to him, very close, arm's length. There was no opportunity for the models to be further recessed. They were forced under the foreground of the paintings because there was no space behind them. Philip always had talked to me about being what I called a modernist realist. His goal was to extend the tenets of modernism, in this case flatness, into an illusionistic art. And when I saw him working in his studio, I understood what he meant, and I understood why his paintings looked the way they looked. I could go on and on with stories about visits with artists I got to meet. The neatness of everything in Bill Bailey's studio in New Haven. The relative chaos of stuff in Sidney Goodman's studio in Philadelphia. Old newspapers, old Polaroids that Sidney had taken. You organize this show by subject matter, the figure, landscape, and still life. But within these categories, you saw a great variety of approaches. For instance, you mentioned earlier the collection and faithful recording of visual data. For sure, there are plenty of contemporary American realist artists who fit the 19th century mold. Consider William Beckman, who squeezes every ounce of the real onto his canvases. Another example, the sculptures of Dwayne Hansen, who made body casts of living humans and dressed these figures in clothing and other accessories to replicate working Americans. Hansen's life-size statues were often mistaken as real human beings. Or another example, the work of Alfred Leslie, who interestingly began his artistic career as an abstract expressionist painter, who in his mid-career became a classic realist painter. Leslie famously said that he wanted to make, quote, pictures that demanded the recognition of individual and specific people. Leslie believed that specificity is the essence of all great portraiture. Figurative artists like Alfred Leslie and both Walter and Martha Erlbacher wanted to get back to the old master traditions where subject was key. Other artists felt differently. Philip Perlstein said, I've always been oriented away from the 19th century. Subject matter never interests me in any work except Charles Dickens. Do you see the same aesthetic variety in other genres? I would say that the same visual diversity that one sees in figurative work can also be seen in contemporary realist landscape painters, Fairfield Porter or Joseph Raphael or Alex Katz. For these painters, nature was the armature on which to construct a modernist painting. Fairfield Porter admired the sensuousness of certain French Impressionist painters like Wiard, as well as the vigorous brushstrokes of his friend Willem de Kooning. I would agree that Porter's approach to painting was empirical, but his primary interest was not in natural phenomenon. To a slightly lesser degree, I think the same can be said for Neil Welliver and Alex Katz. These modernist, realist landscape painters had a sensibility to time, and place, and weather, and light, and color, but they also understood their painting as a personal resolution between perceptual responses to the real world and artistic dogma. Other landscape painters like William Beckman and Rackstraw Downs, the land itself and all its natural qualities was their principal subject. Air and light and place and time and weather, seasons, that was their subject. 
Moving to contemporary American realist still life painters, you see the same level of diversity. Leonard Anderson makes what at first appears to be traditional tabletop still lives. He invests the objects with a certain level of credibility within a distinctly abstract framework. William Bailey's tabletop still lives, painted from memory, I should say, also establishes the reality of the objects he paints, but within a geometric framework of abstract painters like Piet Mondrian, who he admired. Godfrey Flack painted Vanitas still lives. Stephen Posen painted distinctly trompe l'oeil images. And there is a strong group using the precision of photography who exclusively paint the modern world. David Parrish's abstracted images of motorcycles seen at a very close-up range. Frank, it was an epic but aesthetically sprawling show. How would you assess its value? I think the show was important because it tried to include realist artists of many, many persuasions. Traditional painters, social realists, photo realists, modernists who were painting in the guise of realists, I think the show said that reality is defined by a plurality of entities. And this had never really happened before. And I think the show will be remembered for that. Looking back with the advantage of 40 years, it could be said that I was trying to achieve the impossible, giving definition to something that really couldn't be defined. It was too big to be defined in an exhibition. Contemporary realism wasn't really a traditional art movement per se. It had too many tentacles. It couldn't be squeezed into a box. Ironically, the show's strength, inclusivity, was also interpreted as its weakness. Some critics refer to the exhibition as a mishmash. I would say that those critics got it right, except they use the word in a pejorative sense. I see it as a strength. Every artist has his own interests, manner, historical precedence, and look. They're all individuals with strong convictions who want to express the quality of their own personal experiences. And I would argue that each of these artists demonstrates a peculiar American state of mind, a kind of pragmatic sensibility that values the look of things. That's part of the American artistic psyche. And one of Frank's goals for the Academy to serve its students was a resounding success. What that critic labeled as a mishmash of discordant voices, we Academy students saw as a smorgasbord of visual possibilities. Painter Elizabeth Wilson started the Academy in 1980, and she wrote, Quote, this 1981 show was my first exposure to the larger scope of contemporary realist artists and had great influence on me. I remember walking through the show, being overwhelmed by the scale, scope, rigor, skill set, and imagination. Unquote. Here's some work made by Philadelphia Connected Artists who were young back in 1981. 
Those who attended the academy will have asterisks next to their name. So what's the state of realism today, four decades after Frank Goodyear's show? Well, it's still too big to fit in a box. But from my Philadelphia-centric vantage point, I've seen two noteworthy trends. One is the perceptual painting movement, which was begun by academy students who studied with Scott Noel. but they see themselves as part of a legacy begun by Edwin Dickinson, passed on to three artists who had been in Frank Goodyear's 1981 show. Then to artists of Scott Noel's generation, and now to an even younger generation. As the name of the show implies, they work only from direct observation and imagination. Photography as a reference is verboten. The other trend has been given the name Disrupted Realism by artist and critic John Seed. It's a fascinating worldwide quasi-art movement. Alex Konefsky 
an academy graduate is considered somewhat of a leader. An exceptional artist who transitioned from traditional to disrupted realism is Academy graduate Adam Vinson. Philadelphia's Stanek Gallery has been showing this kind of work, and I have made films about those shows. Disrupted realism shows that representational art is adapting to the digital age. Many of the artists have remained close friends. Sadly, many of them have also passed away. But I just have to say that it was a thrill to know so many of them, to see the determination and the courage that they evidenced in their day's work. And um, I feel honored to have known them all. Some of Frank's departed friends went on to become major art world stars with their work selling for millions of dollars. One was Alice Neal, whose rise in the art world helped the next generation of women artists tremendously. The other was Barclay Hendricks. Today, there is a renaissance in black representational art, and I believe Barclay's influence had a great deal to do with it. I asked artist John Moore, who had been in Frank's show, about the future of realism. Bringing minorities into the mainstream has really, I think, energized representation. I think that Kerry James Marshall, for example, is a fabulous artist. He brings narrative, content, subject matter, all of it. I think that Kerry James Marshall and there are other people who are just bringing new things to the table. And I think it's just great. I think it's really great. I totally agree, and I'd like to give a shout out to two younger generation American realists, Cedric Huckabee, whose 2013 show at Swarthmore College I got to document, and Ark Niles, who graduated from the Pennsylvania Academy in 2012 and has gone on to critical acclaim in New York City. This movie would not have been possible without the incredible help of Pennsylvania Academy archivist Wayne Tran, who I would like to nominate as Academy Employee of the Year. And Frank Goodyear, both for your openness and generosity in sharing your insights and memories and for curating these wonderful shows in the first place. Well, what can I say? My hat's off to you. And you too, Betsy. Thanks for filming Frank. <laughs>